Thank you for joining us on another episode of Latter Gay Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Ashworth, and you are at the intersection of sexuality and reality, where it meets at LDS Street and LGBTQ Avenue. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time, and thank you for joining us on this, the third part in our Packer series, we'll call it. Uh, the, um, the Kay and Chris Packer story. This is part three. Uh, we've heard uh, Kay's story. We've heard Chris's story. Now we'll hear the rest of the story, or the best of the story, as uh, the couple sits together to share more of their story and their relationship and how um, this is not even really a mixed orientation, a mixed gender relationship. This is a super interesting experience of better understanding how our individual experiences and situations evolve and how finding the one, finding your person, makes it all worth it and how important it is to be authentic and honest. So we thank you for giving us an hour of your time. We thank you for joining us as part of this series. I know it's been super fascinating, at least it has been for me and for many of you as well. If you are listening on the video version, we invite you to follow along in the live chat and share your concern, or share your no concerns. We have no concerns here. It's only good things. So uh, sh share the positive and meaningful parts of the story as uh, it relates to you. I'd be very interested in seeing uh, what resonates, what means something, uh, what changes you a little, and what you've learned through the Packer story. Also, if you are listening on an audio version, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. We are everywhere you find your favorite uh, audio podcasts, Apple, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more. We invite you to subscribe to this channel. Those who do subscribe will get the episodes just a little bit earlier. So there's a perk there for you who are subscribing to the audio version of the Latter-day Stories podcast episodes. So again, thank you. We invite you to share this one as well. There is a little share button if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, we do invite you to do that. It does help us build bigger and stronger bridges between the LDS and LGBTQ community as we expand our reach sharing episodes just like this one. If you want to catch the previous uh, episodes of the Packers story, they are available uh, on Facebook, on YouTube. Also, all of our episodes, this one and others, are available online at LatterGayStories.org and then clicking the episode tab. Without, uh, with all that aside and without further ado, I want to welcome back to the podcast, um, the Packers, Kay and Chris. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm super excited. Um, excited to wrap up the story. I'm excited to be able to let the audience see the relationship part. Uh, we've first got your individual stories and discussed um, what made each of you you and super fascinating. So for those who haven't and maybe they're cheating and hitting this episode first, I want to just kind of give a brief overview of what we discussed in the other episodes. And it's not a way to save you a couple hours worth of time because <laughs> you definitely need to invest the time into the Packer story. But first, Kay, um, your story just really unpacked the experience growing up a closeted lesbian Mormon yeah. and really trying to do what was right not necessarily for yourself, but to please other people until you realized, and that realize is holding your hand, that life can throw you a curveball. And, and it does. living for yourself and for someone that you love makes all the difference and causes us to do hard things and make some difficult decisions, ultimately, decisions that change our life for the better. True. So that's the case story, kind of, in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Chris, wild story. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you brought the party. Yeah, a lot of, lot of twists and turns. And, and I'm a lot older, so, you know, I got a lot more to show. Far, <laughs> far more experience, that's yeah. what it is. So um, Chris's story is one where we discuss not only sexual orientation, but gender identity and gender expression. Um, you uh, are transgender, born female, transitioned to male um, after the relationship. Yeah. Which is what this episode is going to be about. And, and how that transition impacts this relationship. Right. 
And I think this is an, this is an interesting story because in one aspect, Kay, and I want to get your perspective, um, we talk a lot on this podcast about mixed orientation marriages and um, finding our person according to the parts of us that are the, the parts of us that are attracted. You are a lesbian. You're attracted to women. You're married now to a man. <laughs> it's very interesting. How does this work? Um, um, and, and so that that's kind of what I want to jump into. And so when I say Chris packs a punch, like look what he's done to this whole experience. Um, and I want to unfold that to see how this works. And um, I mean, really, like, are we just bargaining at this point? Are we just giving in because that's the circumstances? I know the answer to that. That's super hypothetical. But I think that's the cool part of this episode is to unpack that and help the audience to see how relationships work and how attraction is just finick and funny at the same time. That's true. So um, who wants, we left off um, Chris's episode. We really teased mm -hmm. both of these episodes with the relationship. Um, Kay, we left off in your episode about rekindling the relationship after a three year hiatus, basically. You had developed a relationship with Chris, uh, with Chris prior to um, you really jumping in and making a commitment. There was a relationship, there was sparks, there were fireworks we talked about, but then you backed off and decided it was more important or part of your journey. You met with a bishop, met with your stake president, went through the, uh, the repentance process that Mormonism somewhat lays out for people in this situation. We left your episode with you knowing that Chris was part of your story and that it was time to go back yeah. and it was time to rekindle that. And, and Chris, that's kind of where we left off on your story right. as well is getting into this relationship. So let's start with you, uh, Kay, and talk about what it was like to make the phone call or rekindle the relationship and say, Hey babe, I'm all in. <laughs> You still around? <laughs> <laughs> um, before we jump into that, which we will, I do want to say that at the beginning of that three-year hiatus is when I reached out to Chris's mom. See, this gets even more exciting for you. <laughs> and outed Chris at that point and said, hey, um, we didn't have like this really great relationship, just more of like a... Um, I'd been to a few family dinners and stuff like that and felt welcomed and um, enough that I felt comfortable to make this phone call and said, um, hey, um, Chris and I have been in a relationship for a while, a long while, about three years. And she's like, okay, well, what kind of relationship? <laughs> and I'm like, well, kind of... Um, I don't know how to say this. I feel super uncomfortable, but romantic rela relationship. And she kind of was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. And I kind of told her why I was, you know, ending the relationship of, you know, I feel like I need to kind of find my way and, you know, let God heal me and, Unfortunately, that means that this is a turning point for us in our relationship. And I'm just concerned, really, that um, Chris is going to need people in his life. And we've kind of eliminated everyone from our relation or friendships and family from being a part of this. Um, I just want to make sure that he's going to be looked after, that you guys are aware and can be his emotional support through this because we've kind of been each other's everything for a solid three years um so it kind of didn't go much further than that she kind of accepted the information and wished me well on my journey ahead and then that's how chris got outed to his parents <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so when i had called my sister to let her, her know um you know because I, I was obviously struggling because we had just broken up and I knew that I needed, I needed something. I needed someone. Mm -hmm. So I spoke to my sister and my sister then said, well, have you talked to mom and dad? And I said, oh, I haven't. And then she said, well, do you want me to? <laughs> and I said, 
yeah, maybe if that, you know, if you think that would, you know, be helpful for them to get a, a preview before, you know, I speak to them. And, and so she, she then called and then returned a call to me and said, oh yeah, uh, Kay already told them. <laughs> and I was like, oh great, um, cool that I didn't even get to have to do that, you know? So I don't know if that was good or bad. I mean, I guess we'll I got off, the, got off the hook a little bit, but, um, but yeah, so that's kind of then, you know, when I kind of, you know, when, when Kay um, came to me and said, you know, we need to break up, I need to go, you know, um, explore this other route, I need to know for sure, um, you know, I was hurt, but I knew that was something she had to do for us to, you know, fully be able to move forward, you know, with her being, you know, younger than me and I had already come to grips with who I was, you know, um, I knew she needed to. And so as hard as it was for me to say, yeah, you know, go take this journey, you know, knowing that I could lose her, um, I knew it was what she needed to do. So, you know, we did that and kind of went forward from there. It was ugly. Yeah. <laughs> it was really sad. And then after those three years, well, during that three years, I want to be transparent. There are some moments that I came back to Chris and said, I, I feel like I'm making a major mistake. Like you are my person. Like, I love you so much still, even though I am trying to let all of this go, like it's so hard because it's so real and it's so prevalent. I can't just stifle it and forget it and move forward as much as I'm doing everything that I feel like I need to. Um, and that happened maybe four Oh, times? it was a yo-yo. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it Which was hard. Which was not <laughs> fair to Chris in his mental state to be like, maybe I'm back. Oh no, I'm not back. Maybe I'm back. Oh, for sure. I'm not back. Oh, sorry. I led you on. I'm not coming back until after those three years, I finally made the, you know, I had my full awareness and awakening of like, this isn't working. And I'm going back to what really spoke true to me and was real. And when I came back, Chris is like, I can't do this. So if it is, if you're here, like either you are or you aren't. And, um, I can't do the yo-yo thing. And I said, no, this is, this is it. This is, I'm ready to move forward. I have clarity. I know what is right for me. And after all of my, you know, prayers and such, I actually had a lot of comfort with this moving forward. Um, uh, I felt like the universe was guiding me back in a way of like, this is where you belonged all along. So just stop <laughs> torturing yourself and go back. And I did. And it kind of was just a aha moment where you're just like, why, why did I suffer three years? That wasn't quite necessary, which with hindsight, I'm glad I went through it to have the clarity. Yeah, and I, I wonder, I mean, I, I don't want to diminish anybody's personal experience, but as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking of other people who have been in your shoes that had relationships, um, either ended those relationships or paused those relationships to reinvent the church and to kind of infuse themselves back into this, well, I didn't try this, I didn't try that, so I need to do this a little bit more exaggerated and then I might know for sure. And of all the experiences and the many, I mean, I've listened to hundreds of stories on this podcast. All of them come back to the relationship. They all navigate back to the feeling of connection and of love and of unity. And none of them that I'm aware of have full activity in the church. So I, I mean, I bring that up just as note that this isn't as abnormal as we're going as we want or think this it really is love is love yeah. and when that connection happens it's for real which leads me to like really want to push 
to the non-affirming audience as evidence that connection is connection. And when we're in these relationships, when you know, you know. And that's the importance of, of being authentic and honest. Uh, if not, then we miss out on our human. Yeah. I didn't want to waste out on <laughs> another minute. Three years was devastating. I, I just wonder, as, as you were kind of navigating that, that journey with um, your church leaders, because that's the three-year hiatus. It was, uh, I don't want to say reinventing yourself, but probably dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's to make sure you didn't miss anything. But also, this could be a familiar experience for a lot of people, allowing God the opportunity to bless you for the first time in this space. And when that didn't happen, that happiness was still there. The, the, the things that you were still looking for, he was waiting for you the whole time. Right. And that's super special, I think. It was real, like you said. I mean, to use that word, I felt like that love was so real and prevalent and everything else I was trying to do just felt like the fake. It, it didn't feel real. Like I'm trying to get these answers. I'm trying to get understanding. I'm trying to find peace with this. I'm doing all the right things. Like things should be, I should be feeling different and I am not at all. And the only place that I've ever felt safe and real and raw and seen and all those things that feel godly to me were with my person. So why am I chasing after something that just feels <laughs> like f it wasn't and stop playing that game and go back to what was real? And for you, Chris, um, was it easy to accept K back into the circle. I, I, I know. Oh, you mean like trust, trust that it was, yeah, because it was hard because, you know, she had come back and forth, but I knew obviously something was drawing her back. I mean, we cared about each other so deeply that, you know, when we broke up originally, it was really, um, I was kind of blindsided and it was hard because I didn't see it coming because we it wasn't like we were fighting or or that we realized that that we had too many different you know that we weren't a good couple and so it was hard um and you know as the three years went on i mean i had people around me saying ah oh, you need to move on you need to try to you know this could go on for a while and um you know she may never come back um something just kept in me just you know just wait and and then once she did come back you know it took some time to have that trust that she wasn't going to disappear again um and we you know worked through a lot of that you know that trust issue but it wasn't hard because again we cared about each other at that point she had told her family and i knew that was a big deal that if she's going to tell her family that we're together and, and, you know, it's not going to change. I knew that that was, you know, that was pretty critical for us moving on and that she was going to most likely stay, you know, in the relationship. So, um, Chris was in a relationship when I came back. Well, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is definitely where the tea gets. <laughs> so I definitely, <laughs> I broke that up. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> but um, that was a hard part, too, of me feeling like this person is moving on and I'm not going to be a part of it. And I'm going to lose my person because of this other part that I feel is not working. So that definitely helped motivate me. So that's full transparency. <laughs> In, in the spirit of full transparency, um, I wonder also, Chris, in your world, was there animosity towards the church? Um, because it was the church that was separating you from yeah. the person that you love. No, as much as I had tried not to have, you know, bitter feelings towards the church and what I felt it is, 
you know, my upbringing and, and all the guilt that surrounded, you know, me growing up in the church, um, I definitely felt, um, you know, a frustration. And I mean, I guess even just a, an anger towards, okay, now I finally have found something that is worth living for and worth moving forward in life. And I think that's, you know, because before then, um, I was still trying to at least attend church. I wasn't, um, I mean, I was active enough, but not overly involved. And at that point, I stopped going because I felt, you do, you feel a little betrayed. Like, I finally have found some happiness, and it's been long coming, and now this is what happens. So. I think that's... Uh... That's honest. I mean that, and I think that I think that's reflective of what a lot of people would experience in that same situation. And and given your background in Mormonism, um, I mean you have a hash of a air quote Mormon royalty family, and so there's a there's a lot to live up to there. Um, your dad is well known in Mormon circles. Your great uncle is well known and an apostle in the church, right. very well known in in circles, and and it's 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 one thing to have this personally impact your own experience. It's a different thing when it interferes with your ability to move on. And so I, I think your your answer is honest. What is what is it like to rekindle this relationship? Now you you said you based it on I'm you've got to be all in. Like it's time for you to. I mean, this is almost like a marriage proposal. It's if you're coming back, you're coming back for good. Yeah. And that it marriage. sounds like both of you are on board with it. Yeah, the marriage proposal happened fast. <laughs> yeah, well, because I had, we had, um, as, as I guess non-traditional as our situation is, we're very traditional in a sense of um, we, you know, we knew that we would want to get married if we were going to you know, live together and move forward as a couple. Um, and so, yeah, I purchased a ring and everything prior to the breakup even. And um, I know. And so it just sat there for three years just uh, stewing, <laughs> you know. And um, so, yeah, we did, you know, I guess to make sure that it was, you know, serious and there was a commitment we we did get engaged quite quickly, so. Well, I would expect nothing less. <laughs> good <laughs> BYU student to make sure that this relationship was uh, signed, sealed, and delivered within three weeks. Of <laughs> I don't know if it was that quick, but yeah. It was pretty quick. Like after a summer, I had gone on a trip, came back. My brother, I had like been staying at his house, and he was going to be coming back after the summer. And so it was almost like, okay, where am I going? <laughs> I need a place to stay. So should we get engaged and move that along? And we we did really quickly in September of 2010. We got engaged. And by July 2011, we were married. So I, I want to discuss a little bit about the deconstruction. Because okay. obviously, Kay, you, you were ready to jump into the relationship, which means you had to abandon the thing that kept you apart for three years, or at least create some distance between there. Um, how did that discussion go? Because you had met with your bishop and, and your stake president, and they're the ones that essentially laid out the three-year plan, or the plan that lasted three years. Uh, how did that deconstruction begin? What were the processes within that? Um, your discussion, was there disappointment with the church leaders who thought that you were on the right track and succeeding? Um, how did that process go before we get to the overall relationship? So because I had come out and like we're, I was talking to my family ward bishop and stake president, um, within that three years, I had moved out with some roommates and was going to a singles ward. And that bishop, to my knowledge, didn't know. I never came out to him because I'm like, I don't need to come out again to you. I'm just going to stay on my path and keep doing my work. Um, and there's no point to have to say anything 
to this bishop who I've already confessed to another bishop, right? So there was this like disconnect from the people that I had, who had eyes on me in a sense. And this new single ward bishop didn't have that awareness that I know of. I do, I guess, isn't there like a file that follows you? I somewhat <laughs> am like suspicious, like what is in my file? If there, but was, if there was a disciplinary council. I didn't have a. Yeah, there, there would have been. If not, then you were probably off the record. So that was all wiped clean. And <laughs> well, and, and you, you weren't, well, so there was a period of time that the church would annotate records, meaning they'd put a little asterisk next to your membership record that said that you're a threat to children. Oh. And because you're lesbian or gay, you could not work with children, hold a calling with children. And it was a notice for them to alert another bishop um, of that. Chances are you probably weren't an annotated. Um, transgender Latter-day Saints who transition, all of their records are annotated today oh, um, oh. in 2020. That is the Still. name of the game. That is a rule. Uh, handbook section 33 discusses the annotation of records, but one of them specifically is transgender members who have transitioned. But So chances are no, they didn't fall. They, yeah, you had a pretty Yeah, it mission. was fairly easy to kind of go under the radar and just move in with Chris and not really have anyone follow me. And I never had my records moved from that singles ward. But at some point I do remember they reached out when I was living with Chris and tried to at some point figure out where I was. And that's when we were pretty much getting our marriage planned out. We were going to head to um, Boston, New York or Boston, Massachusetts to get married and that's where we decided like before we get married we want to remove our names we don't want to have that um, association but also we want to control this situation and not be like excommunicated for something we no longer fit the box fit the mold we're not living this standard we're moving forward on our relationship so we're gonna leave on our terms so you're talking about resignation from the church you wanted to pull your membership records out of the church, cancel your membership, and just move on. With Before we got married. Your life. And this is 2010? Yeah. Yeah. So this Either. is pre-November 2015 policy, where right. you automatically would have been deemed um, an apostate, and the church would have excommunicated you anyway. <laughs> right. Oh, great. Right. <laughs> so we've, but you we avoided that. Really you're avoided. a lower, lower case A apostate right now. You <laughs> right, right. The official November 2015 apostate. There's a spectrum. <laughs> but you're, you're clearly roommates, these lesbian room, non-lesbian right. roommates yes. uh, living together. Um, but there did come the point where you were done with the church. Right. right. Yeah. And... You know, I knew that because we were going to go get married and, I mean, we had no intentions on, you know, um, continuing to be members and attending and, and stuff like that. It's like, it just made sense to respectfully leave, you know. Well, um, from what I understand, no intention on telling family members either that you were taking off and getting married. <laughs> oh, as far as, oh, you mean like to Massachusetts? Oh yeah. Well, my parents actually went oh. with us. Yeah. They didn't know about the <laughs> engagement or like proposal per se until later. So, and then we invited them when we started planning the wedding to come. Um, and unfortunately no one in my family came. Um, but Chris's family was supportive. <laughs> yeah. So you uh, you um, chose Massachusetts as a wedding venue because 2010-11, marriage equality finally happened, uh, and Massachusetts was one of the first states in the union that allowed right. same-gender marriages. Yeah, and it, well, California had been kind of off and on, but when we were looking at all the places that it was legal, um, Massachusetts was the only... Um, shortly after we had scheduled everything, uh, New York then changed, um, and then, and then we all know the events that kind of followed. You know, here in Utah, when Utah kind of came, helped it come crashing down. 
But another reason why we chose um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, is because the first same-sex marriage was done in this um, building, courthouse. the courthouse that we got married in. That's where the very first one same-sex marriage was, you know, done in that same courthouse. And we wanted that history um, and having it mean something for what we were doing too so it was kind of a beautiful like place and meaningful and recognized and kind of everything that we were wanting so yeah and i, I could see some level not wanting this to feel nefarious or yeah. skirting under the law but here here was an opportunity that to get married legally lawfully chris is chris your parents were there mm -hmm. Kay, your family no show my mom did say that if I needed someone to save me. She would fly out there and come get me <laughs> to save me. Well, that's an olive branch. I think my sister would have come. One of my sisters that I'm really clo close with would have probably come if financially that was an option, but at the time, no. So, What did, what did the wedding mean to you? This is uh, not a really a loaded question, but sometimes when we talk about same-gender marriages, the the heteronormative version of a marriage is that, yeah, you get married because you're making these commitments for a future family, kids. Um, why was marriage so important to you individually? What, what, was a, what was it about marriage that said, we have to have one of those? Uh, I think it's just the level of commitment. I mean, I, I mean, I, if you look, I guess, just um traditionally that's the most committed you are to a person is that you you know become married and move forward as a as a couple and because we knew that the rights um you know at the time i i mean we didn't think that utah would would turn out the way that it did at least not for a long time and so it wasn't for the rights it was you know just showing each other that we were in this you know for the long long term and we were committed to each other and um you know we thought eventually that you know once i you know finished work and retired that we might move to a place where there were rights um you know for us you know, we thought, oh, maybe California or something, um, not knowing what was right around the corner. So, For me, I mean, obviously growing up in the church, you're always raised with that ending goal in mind. Like, you get married, and then you live happily ever after. I mean, that's even the fairy tale story, right? So for me, just marriage felt like... And maybe that's just part of like the boxes being marked just felt like I was hitting that part that was so important to accomplish, but at the same time with the right person. So it being the right person in my own time. Um, so that's why it was really important to me to feel like marriage was needing to feel more official than just like a promise to each other, you know? Yeah, I like that. And I, and I think that is... A great aspect of of marriage and the importance of of connection it probably also helped chris to say you're not running away <laughs> <laughs> locked <laughs> in uh, no more mormonism in between us right <sighs> no what uh so coming home the euphoria of the wedding you've made a mad dash to massachusetts um you were married legally one of the few like cases of these weddings that were happening in the United States and you land in Salt Lake City and the reality hits like you are now a a couple a gay married couple um, in the state of Utah how does that translate to and I want to hit this in two two parts of the question to family and then to work um, being so fresh and so new and so polarizing we just come out of prop 8 California and especially within Mormonism like the church was all in on and making sure that people like you didn't succeed. Right. So how are those two different communities? How did they welcome you or what resistance did you see? 
Well, um, it it was hard. I mean, because you know, now I started attending family events, and you know, there were a few at the time members that that um, d were happy for us and were accepting and and social. And but there was a lot in her family that weren't, and and I could feel it, and I'm sure she could feel it, but. Um, it was hard, but um, again, you know, being supportive and wanted to, you know, show that you know we're committed and we're we're doing this together. You know, I still attended these events when I felt like I wasn't wanted, um, and it was hard. Um, my family was really quite accepting and loving, and and you know, probably like her more than me, you know, <laughs> I mean, they, they no. think, oh, we've got, you know, this really great no. dot new, you know, a new family member. And so, you know, there was a difference um, between the two. We do a lot more things with Kay's family. Um, so it, it was hard. Um, but, you know, slowly it, it has become, you know, better. I mean, now we're uh, 10 plus years into this and and it's night and day how I'm treated and how Having. we're treated. And so I think it helped that when we had kids, they, they really wanted to be a part of that. So they knew they had to be a little more, more accepting. Um, and I think once I transitioned, I think they became a little more, because now we look, we don't look like a lesbian couple obviously We're now. just straight now <laughs> <laughs> so i think you know sadly image plays a big part in acceptance and so for them seeing you know and introducing us now as we are right now i think made them feel more comfortable with that and it's unfortunate because i'm still the same person um, that i was then and um, but, you know, prior to transitioning, it was getting better to where they started realizing who I was as a person and that I really cared about their daughter and I loved and, you know, and stuff like that. Um, just, you know, the communities that we were in and workplaces and stuff. I worked at Wells Fargo at the time and I really appreciated the fact that um, Wells Fargo was all for same-sex marriage and supporting and, you know, we're in the gay parade and the pride parades and everything. And I always just felt like where I worked was so safe to be who I was, who I am. They loved Chris. They loved, you know, very kind and very excited about our wedding. I mean, they were just so, so, so supportive, my work people, which I am so grateful for because that helped me be excited about our marriage and our wedding and feeling like I got to share those details with people that really sincerely felt like they could express their excitement for me without, um, even though some of them were Mormons, you know, but in that atmosphere, they felt like they could be honestly happy for me because they were out of a religious setting in a way. Um, and Chris's friends at work and everything were very supportive for the most part. And yeah, then, I mean, it was a little different because, um, again, the nature of my job and where I work, um, being a more conservative area of the state. Um, in education. In education, I know. It was, um, I mean, it was, challenging but not i mean you know as far as the people that i work directly with um very happy and supportive at least you know to my face i'm sure there was plenty that maybe you know thought otherwise but uh never had any backlash or um you know what's surprising is the the teenagers that i work with are amazing they they don't see what adults see i mean they they were happy for me you know it's amazing what generations you know how they approach things um very kind you know because i was always worried that you know you always think of you know kids that tease and and want to say things especially to I, I was an assistant principal so i'm an easy target for kids not liking you know 
the the authority and the and the disciplinary type thing but i never had a student ever like disrespect me or say anything unkind and you know same with you know the community that i worked in and even you know district level very supportive um of you know what we went and and did follow-up question on the family and this is more directed to you chris because you you're uncle was Boyd K. Packer was, and now, um, I mean, so two follow-up questions. Was this the first same gender marriage in the Packer family? You know, I would imagine so as far as a marriage now relationships, it's, it's always hard to say, you know, if there were some closeted uncles and aunts, you know, from previous generations and stuff. But, um, as far as I know, um, I'm probably the first to, you know, legally get married and, and do that. Um, I know that, um, one of my closest relatives is one of uncle Boyd's, um, it's his grandson. Um, he and his wife have been so supportive and some of our best allies as far as, um, you know, trying to put religion aside and say, your, you. your family, you know, your family and you always will be. And, we don't look upon it differently and we're very close but no memorable wedding uh, <laughs> gift from boyd and donna at all no, no. unfortunately not <laughs> i don't know i'm i'm sure maybe my dad made them aware but um yeah we didn't sadly put him on the invite list he uh, didn't conduct our <laughs> wedding yeah oh i know what a missed opportunity <laughs> i know for elder packer to be able to uh, officiate in the wedding <laughs> of these two beautiful souls sad Glorious. missed opportunities darn that's what the uh, millennium is for right yep that's the third we can do that the third wedding <laughs> third wedding try oh. try number three <laughs> we might get three out of this oh wow <laughs> um so where does this how does the story unfold from here you you're married in massachusetts you're home you're right. you're telling friends and family surprise everyone right um and things aren't actually as awful as you had right assumed or prepared yourself for them to be right yeah well we kind of get to the next hurdle i mean i did try and change my name oh yeah there we had to go through a name change and instead of just being able to show our wedding certificate from from Boston, um, she had to do a legal name change, um, you know, before a court and everything. Um, it was important for me enough to feel like I wanted to share in the same last name and just feel like we were normal, right? It, I didn't have to do that. I wanted to do that for us to even feel more connected in a way. Right. And so then um, following that is the next step is kids and, and, you know, that has had its own challenges as far as, um, I think things have changed now, but at the time, um, a lot of places didn't want to help us have kids as far as, um, fertility clinics. Um, so we were able to use a, a donor clinic in California and, and then, um, we had a blessed midwife that, that helped and, you know, I'm speeding up a very long process of, of hardship trying to just have kids, you know, um, and so. And being able to get the donor we wanted because <laughs> that I didn't get pregnant right away. And the first donor that we picked, we tried to kind of match it to Chris and felt like um, we found the perfect guy. And then we didn't, I mean, we were amateurs. We didn't know what we were doing quite. So we didn't buy all these vials to keep trying. Cause I thought I'm young, I'm healthy. I'm going to get pregnant like this, <laughs> like every other Mormon person <laughs> that I felt like at that moment. I know that's not everyone's story, but I didn't get pregnant right away. And it took a lot, a lot of tries, um, well over a year of trying. Um, and we had to try other donors, which was kind of sad and disappointing and feeling like we weren't getting the one that we really wanted, but these were others that were good. And finally we got a call cause I was on a list. Like if this guy 
Mike is more in for whatever reason. If someone sells any of his vials back, please reach out to me. And after a year and some of trying, they reached out and said, hey, we just got X amount sold back. Are you interested? And we're like, yes, oh my gosh. So we bought all of those up. And luckily after I think two tries, yeah, two tries it took with that donor. So we got the donor that we wanted, which was really exciting. Um, and that kind of started a whole nother journey of now we have children in the picture, right? So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, I mean, it's had its challenges. I mean, I, and I know, and I never want to discount everyone's process of trying to have kids because we're not unique in that as far as, I mean, there's plenty of, Hardship. of, you know, um, husband and wife that have similar difficulties and, and things like that. But, you know, the challenges of then navigating, um, insurance and, um, expense, you know, things that, um, you know, we didn't really anticipate, um, not being legally married in Utah, um, had its challenges then when, you know, we finally were there having the baby. Um, a great story is we had just had our son and we named him Boston, where we got, um, married. Where we got married and he, um, we were trying to fill out the birth certificate and we didn't know how to fill it out because we were legally married, but not legally married in Utah as far as recognition. And so we had to call the, the, you know, the registrar for the hospital and say, Oh, how do you want us to fill this out? You know? And obviously at the time we could only put Kay's name on the birth certificate and, and everything. And then, so we filled it out just like they said and submitted it. And then, um, and then a couple days after Boston being born, um, marriage became legal here in Utah. And we, um, we kind of found out when we were driving home from the hospital and, and I don't know if you want to take the story from here as far as our trying to, well, we were in the hospital. So our son was born on December 18th, 2013. And we left the hospital, I think two days later, it was the 20th or the 21st when everything happened here in Utah, where they were allowing people to go get married and, after a whole court ordeal, of course, and grateful to the guys who made this possible. But um, we have friends that went up the night that all of this was going on and they reached out and said, like, did you hear, you know, you can get married? And they were on the news and they were showing them getting married and everything. And we're like, we got to do this for insurance. <laughs> <laughs> We just have a kid. We need to make this. I mean, because I was planning on going back to work for insurance purposes, but I'm like, if Utah's going to recognize our marriage, we got to find a way to get up there, <laughs> like right now. So even though my labor and delivery wasn't, you know, very beautiful, I mean, it was hard. It was a very unfortunate, I mean, there was a lot of things that happened. I was not in a good, I was not in good shape. But I was like, I will suck it up. I will do whatever we have to do with our newborn child with us. We will go up there to wherever we have to go to find the place to get married. Where do we go? So tell them all the places we went. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. So um, we first went to Davis County in Farmington. Their, their courthouse was supposed to be open um, on a Saturday. They were going to make an exception or at least that was the rumor. So there's a ton of people that were up there, were out in the snow waiting, and then realized, oh, that's not happening. So we went back home, then we got another call saying Ogden, and we live in Draper, so we're making these big trips with a newborn baby in I the car. I was not comfortable. And, and went up to Ogden, uh, waited in line, um, and this is, you know, middle of December, so it was really cold, and they didn't feel like it was safe to to open and perform marriages. So then they didn't open. So went back home and then found out that in Salt Lake on Monday, they were going to open 
you know, early, but there was the risk that the governor was going to put a stay on it, you know, as soon as maybe nine o'clock in the morning. And so we're like, we got to get in line. So I left Kay and, and Boston at home. Um, and I went with some friends and waited overnight in line um, just so I could be, f you know, one of the first in line because um, I wanted to make sure that we, you know, we beat that deadline. And then as soon as we were able to get in, um, then Kay came over with Boston and he witnessed our second <laughs> marriage <laughs> in, the, in the courthouse. I want to bring up two points that I think is uh, prevalent to this discussion. First, in terms of surrogacy and having children, the lengths that a couple would go through um, when, when someone wants to look at the LGBTQ experience and say, oh yeah, it's, you're just privileged, you're, just, you're pushing your rights, you're, um, why don't you just be equal like the rest, I mean, just all the things you hear and going through your experience having children, that's not equal. That's, that is not an experience that mirrors a traditional heterosexual relationship. No. Um, yeah. the, the hoops, and, and granted, this was, um, what, 13, 2013, 15? 2013. 13, yeah. Um, things have gotten a little better, but I, I just want to focus on the lengths that you had to go through in order to build a family because you wanted to. And in that same vein, the lengths that you had to go through to unite your family. You, you had to get married in Massachusetts in order to make your marriage legal. You had to get remarried in Utah in order to make your marriage legal. You wanted to be married. And, and I just hope the audience sees the dedication um, that you both have to the institution of marriage. Because so often in this space, people say, you are vilifying, you are, your marriage is counterfeit. Um, you are turning the definition of marriage on its head. And I look at your story and say, you are the definition of marriage. You are what we want in a married couple. Someone who will go state to state, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, to make it official and legal because you want to be with your person. That is the definition of marriage. I don't see anything counterfeit about that. Yeah, and and w what was amazing, you know, in part of our journey through this is um, the one of the ladies uh, at the hospital um, realized that this was happening in Utah, and she had called the the state records vital records person to kind of get some information on how were to fill out this is the original birth certificate you know information and she remembered our story and i got a call it was a few days after we had gotten married again in utah and she said i remember you from you know trying to figure out how to fill out this form and she said, you know, those records aren't, um, you have a week to amend those records before they, you know, go in and, and they're official. And, um, and she said, you know, if you hustle down to the um, vital records, you can get your name. on the birth certificate. So I think I'm probably the first Utah that didn't have to adopt their child. I'm, I was on the birth certificate as a parent and it was that person reaching out. They didn't have to do that, but they remembered, you know, our story and said, Hey, we want to help you out. And so I didn't have to adopt, you know, my kids. Now it's different. There's different protocols in the hospital and, and it's possible now that now what the great thing is about records. In fact, when we had our second, when we had our daughter, the, the form, instead of saying mother and father, it says parent and parent. 
So it it's recognizing that, um, you know, it's not always just a mom and a dad. So I just thought it was awesome that they did that for us. And that, that leads to a more inclusive society. And that means something to you and it, it means something to your children as well. Wow. Um, that's a lot. Thank you. Um, and it's not just your testosterone that makes people cry. <laughs> My testosterone made me cry too. It's beautiful <laughs> to feel all the feelings. Yeah, and I, I just hope people honor uh, honor that experience and 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 really just look at what it takes. Um, w- this isn't uh, maybe I just belabor the the point, but it this is what the institution of marriage means to the queer community too. Like we are doing the work and and we're putting the effort into these relationships as well um, because we value the importance of the definition of marriage and of family and and i think that expands beyond the mormon lens that we see most of these issues through at what point do we get um Chris transitioning in the discussion. <laughs> I know Chris the real exciting because <laughs> as if this, this this whole story isn't full of twists and turns already. Um, spoiler alert: your wife becomes your husband, and there's a story here. <laughs> well, yeah, we need to get that corrected on our marriage certificate. Still, <laughs> I think that's one of the last things I need to correct. But um, so. Like I I had mentioned in the previous recording, um, Kay knew how I felt when we met. I wanted to be very honest with her, so she didn't feel like she was going into this with, you know, a very feminine female and and that felt very female. And so she knew. um, I'm hoping she fell in love with the person inside because, you know... um, you know, I wasn't the most of feminine women. And um, so she knew. Um, so kind of what had happened is um, I, I started noticing and, and realizing people are changing. People are transitioning, even at an older age. And I just was so envious. I found myself, and I'm usually not one to to covet different things or, you know, envy situations. And, but I found myself feeling that way. Like, why can't I do that? Why can't I realize that and, and make it happen? And, um, so I kind of researched out and, you know, I even had a few transgender students that I were, that, you know, attended our school and, and I was like, oh, you're so, you know, in my head, I was thinking, oh, you're so lucky. Um, you know, as I worked with them thinking, oh, at a very young age, you're making yourself kind of whole, you know. And so I finally got to a point um, with our kids, you know, so I, I give credit to my my son for giving me the courage to do something because um, as my son got you know, he was right around two. He, you know, that's the age where they start recognizing people like, oh, mom's a girl and she and her and, you know, and we point out different people and they start recognizing, oh, you know, boys and girls. And when he got to me, he didn't know. He didn't know who I was, you know, I guess what I was, you know, he couldn't identify and I saw the little confusion on his face and it really, you know, it brought up all those emotions of I'm not letting my kids see who I am. You know, he has no idea who I am. And, and so I, I credit him because, you know, I value my kids' opinion of me as a parent and now as a father. Um, I want them to be proud of me and um, and really know me because sometimes you don't get to really know your parents 
as well as maybe you should, or you don't, you don't know, you know, maybe the things that they've gone through because they haven't maybe let you know, but I wanted him to know. I wanted to be honest. I said, you know, I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I told her, I said, you're the deal breaker. If you say no, we'll navigate life in this neutral world. I mean, it was awkward going into restrooms, locker rooms, being the state I was in. I, I got mistaken a lot. So it's, it's not an easy life living in that neutral world as far as being out in public and kind of the awkwardness and the things you go through. So it's hard. But I said, you know, I'm willing to continue down that road and kind of explain to the kids and their friends and fa you know who you know who I am and and I said but if you say yes I don't care what anyone else thinks I don't care I'll work through my work uh family I'll we'll work through it you know, I said, you're the one that matters most. And if you've got a problem with it, I won't do it. If you are okay, um, I will. So then I can let her explain what, how she felt at that time. Well, for me, it was very, an easy choice to make for him. I mean, I wanted him to feel whole. I wanted him to see himself when he looked in the mirror. I wanted him to feel like he loved himself because I feel like that's such an important part of being human is to look into the mirror and see your reflection and go, I love you. I see you. I know you. It's that soul within you're seeing too, right? Yes, there is that outside shell, which is our body that you see when we look in the mirror, but our soul, like everything matching up and feeling it all come together and recognizing yourself. Like for me, I wanted that for him to, he's gone his whole life not having that. And I had seen all the pain and the suffering and I just, easy yes. You know, I wanted him, <clears throat> I didn't know what it m would mean, but it was easy. It was easy to be like, I want you to feel that wholeness. I want you to feel like you are you and that you are complete. So that was definitely no, <laughs> no um, hard choice there. But I didn't know what was going to come with it because that was definitely <laughs> <laughs> to make light. There was some big changes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, at this point, we had two kids. We have Boston and Brooklyn, and Brooklyn was about six months old when he started his transition. Yeah, so this is about five, five years ago. So everything was pretty paced. It wasn't yeah. like there was any really crazy, you know, overnight changes. It was just really one step at a time. And at this point, through through our relationship, Chris had done different. Um, I guess, procedures in a sense to feel more masculine. And so um, I'll let you take over. Oh, so yeah. So we, so prior to that, I had already had a mastectomy. So I, you know, because I felt like, well, that's something I can do without transitioning, you know, completely. And you talked so, earlier in your story about the, the dysphoria. Oh, yeah. That you looked in the mirror and just didn't see. Oh, yeah. The reflection wasn't you and buying different clothes and and that dysphoria as it i mean it it didn't just creep it existed throughout right. all those different experiences yeah and so slowly i mean the transition yeah i mean because like i had mentioned in in my previous recording i um after ending you know a, a marriage and then and then moving on saying i'm not going to date you know slowly i was trying to to invent what I was going to be and, you know, not knowing that I would be able to fully, you know, transition. So yeah, you know, more masculine clo clothing and, um, and like I said, I had a previous surgery and, and stuff just to do as much as I thought I could do. Um, 
you know, not really caring what everyone else thought, but again, to have that peace with myself. And so, so when we, when I decided to transition, you know, we went and saw, there's a doctor in Salt Lake that helps, um, you know, at the time she was the only one that would help, um, transgender individuals and went to her. We had a lot of questions. Um, you know, one of the main things is Kay's like, oh, I hope is is his personality gonna change because well you and know. i was so attracted to chris i'm like what is what like kind of changes are we gonna see here is um am i gonna be married to schmeagle at the end <laughs> i know that's so terrible to say but like voice changes and acne and there's just so many things that they're telling you and you're like okay okay <laughs> <laughs> well yeah because we had a lot of questions and and one thing she said confidently she says especially at your age she says you're who you are. This isn't going to change like your insides as far as compassion. And obviously the tears, it didn't, didn't uh, change that. Then, you know, I'm an emotional, compassionate person and it, and it didn't affect that. And, and it hasn't. Um, but we had a lot of questions and we, um, so we started on the journey. Um, and it's been about five years and, you know, then I had to go to work and explain you know and that was a hard conversation you know to sit at work i pulled a couple people that you know my supervisor my principal and one of the secretaries and i let them know what i was doing i said i don't know what that means for work i mean they have already gotten used to us you know in a in a same-sex marriage you know in our community in the district so I'm like, I don't know how it's going to work with the transgender, but I let them know that I was starting to transition and they were very supportive. And my principal said, I will talk to the district and let them know that we're going to support you through this. And um, I remember, you know, um, as I started the first year, there wasn't a, you know, a ton of you know, changes right away. It takes time to develop, you know, your voice, the, the facial hair, you know, your, your body changes and stuff like that. And so um, what the, our student council supervisor said, you know what, let me see if we can get the student body to kind of help because we, I was starting to go by he and him and, and Mr. And so that was going to take a lot of practice and, and stuff. So I remember meeting with our, you know, big student council and, and that was hard. I mean, that's one of the first times I, I told a group of people, you know, what I was doing and why, and, and they were so supportive. The kids were just, you know, just very, um, love loving and warm and, and said, we'll help you. We'll, we'll start referring to you like that. And then I'm sure others will start, you know, and so slowly, you know, it, it happened. And then, you know, um, and then from there, I've, I've moved on from that school. I then became a principal. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I feel good that at least, you know, some of this has not inhibited me professionally. Um, and I'm very lucky that way. I think the, the, I mean, there's a lot of nuggets there that I would love to spend hours on. A, uh, the youth, the children really, the kids really are the strength to this topic. Um, in terms of religious affiliation, that's one of the great things Mormonism is most afraid of. Elder Holland spoke to the faculty at BYU and said that one of the biggest issues we have is that these young people are blurring the line between condoning and advocacy when it comes to their LGBTQ friends and family members. And I say beautiful. The fact that our young people are blurring the lines and they don't see this as a problem, they don't see this as a, as a, as a hiccup, they don't see this as an issue, means that our young people are driving the wagon train of innovation and acceptance and understanding and compassion and empathy and it's all the things that religion should be 
and it's coming from the youth. Be like a little child, apparently. Um, second is your faculty um, the, and administration, the fact that they support and were behind you. And, and we can't blanket statement say everybody was. Right. And I, it's not fair to say that. But generally, and I think, I think this is a testament, maybe one of the best parts of this whole story in terms of what I want to always do in this podcast episode uh, in episodes is show that LGBTQ people have a place in society that they can make a meaningful difference in society, that our talents and our time and our, our professional abilities are not only welcome and necessary, but needed and, and supported in spaces, uh, especially professional spaces. So I, I, think that's a, I think your story is a testament to the narrative, it defies the narrative that's been placed so many times that people like us shouldn't be working with children. People like us shouldn't have uh, professions that are in the public. People like us shouldn't be around uh, vulnerable populations. We are defying those narratives because people like us are necessary in those spaces. We are the ones who are building the future generation beautifully. So thank you. Well, it's, you know, it, um, I remember, um, you know, cause you know, I was always kind of the go-to when it comes to working with LGBTQ kids in the, in the school, um, because they, you know, a lot of the administrators felt like, um, I would have a little more understanding and, and be helpful. So I seemed to, you know, whenever something would come up that there was support needed, they would, you know, bring kids in and, and parents in too. And um, I recall many a time when I'd be sitting across from a parent and they'd have a lot of worry as to how their kids would be treated at school, how they would be able to, you know, function without any, you know, um, problems or bullying or anything like that. And and um, I always kept pictures of m me and my family behind me on my, in my office. And I, I recalled many a time when I would say, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna take care of them. We're gonna make sure that, that, you know, certain things are in place for them and that they always have a place to go if they need anything. And, and you know, and obviously I could, you know, I was an advocate and could speak from experience. And, you know, a lot of the parents would kind of look behind me, you know, because they, they always uh, were concerned about what their kid's future was going to look like, what kind of like what you explained. They just didn't know if they could have a good job and go to college and, and things like that. And it's like, but when they could see me, and how I was thriving and doing well, and I had a family, and they could see my family in the pictures, they, they kind of had this little peace of mind that, you know what, everything is going to be okay. You know, it doesn't guarantee everything, but what they're fearing um, isn't necessarily going to happen. You know, it, there's all the, the possibilities in the world for young people and what they can do and their potential. And so... You know, having people like me and you and, and others out there advocating and, and showing the world we're healthy, happy individuals. You know, we can, you can do anything and everything um, really puts, I think, some comfort and peace for parents, especially. Amen and amen. Honestly, visibility matters. And I, I'm a firm believer that little baby gay kids need to see the successes and stories of adult gay people. Um, and, and growing up, just seeing yourself represented in these spaces means something. If back to what we discussed in both of your individual episodes, how much bandwidth are we willing to waste? It's time to start giving our queer kids an opportunity, an opportunity to thrive and succeed and to be exactly the things that they need to be. And they, they were designed to be. And I think, we're, I think we're doing society a disservice by not giving those opportunities to our, our queer kids and adults and young adults.
a queer population, that's for sure. Tend. Yeah. So, you know, through the transition, obviously all the, the ups and downs of trying to do the name change and, and things like that. Gender change. Um, yeah. It's been, you know, some hurdles, but we're, you know, it's, it's taken me about five years to get through most everything that I've needed to, to change. And, and obviously, you know, the changes that I've done physically, Kay's had to adjust to, you know, cause it's like, yeah, I mean, things that I had no idea, you know, you know, not being in the man world or growing up with brothers or anything, you know, it's like going through puberty twice. Let me tell you, it's, it's rough, you know, but you know, but I'll have empathy for both my daughter and my son because I'll, <laughs> I've experienced, you know, both, both things. And so, um, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, the, the process of the whole thing. Um, but I do recall, um, you know, I had the long, I had long hair for the longest time. He looked like a surfer. I did. It was kind of bleached and not anything like what I look like now. Um, and we were always worried, what am I going to look like after this? And, and, you know, I've had, you know, people that I've worked with and stuff that, you know, sheepishly come up and say, you know what, you look pretty good, <laughs> you know, for, they're like for, embarrassed <laughs> to admit like, dang, you look I, good. You're I know attractive. they're a little, <laughs> I, I think they think, is this wrong of me to There's think now here. you're attractive when really I know the, the truth behind it. It's like, no, it's, it's, you know, it's all good. But, you know, I had long hair and, um, I remember, um, Kay, you know, she'd cut her hair kind of shorter and, and, and I Big had mistake. said, <laughs> and I said, uh -huh. I think it's time that I look more, you know, masculine. masculine. And so she, she being a hair, you know, hairdresser and stuff, she went out and we cut off all that long hair. And I remember, you know, going in to see what it looked like. And I looked in the mirror and I actually looked in the mirror and, and I said, I looked and I went, oh, there you are. I finally got to see what was in there all along. And just to have that, that, you know, to be able to see what you felt for so long and to have that visual, it was just, it was amazing. So it's, it, it just has put a piece to my struggle. Yeah. Stupid testosterone. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and yet you're okay. She's okay. I think maybe we need estrogen. <laughs> maybe that's what I needed. Crazy. <laughs> I feel all the feelings. I, I feel it. It's more so much happiness and so much joy for him to have a full you know, full circle, full completion of like that self-realization. And like, I love that beautiful, like metamorphosis of the butterfly that really all of a sudden has the wings and is like flying truly. Yeah. Cause I have people at work that knew me, you know, knew me before and now after, and I've had a few pull me aside and say, you know what, you, you always have been a happy person you know, always very good and helpful and happy, but there's something different about you now. You, if it's possible, you look more happy. You look Better. at Pete, you <laughs> yeah. know, happy and confident and, and all those things that were lacking, um, from my life that came from finally letting the world see me, you know, for who I am. So I just love that. There you are love that that is what this is all about it's just beautiful it is yeah now yeah. i don't mind pictures so much you should <laughs> tell him about boston oh yes oh if you really want i want to make him cry more. waterworks i know cry more. so you know for the longest time um because my son was so young and and brooklyn was so he was about th three yeah because he's eight now. He was about three when I started. So he didn't know. I mean, he knew me as dad, you know, and 
when he started, you know, talking and, you know, um, and then our daughter was, you know, barely one at the time. And we kept having discussions. When do we tell our kids? Because, you know, many of our neighbors know we've been very transparent. We're not trying to hide. Um, we're we, really an open book. Like I feel yeah. like visibility is so important and those conversations are so important. So we hide nothing just so people can feel like they can come at any point and have conversations so we can just show them our soul, our pieces. Yeah. And so we knew that there'd be a time where we'd have to tell our kids, you know, because eventually they're going to hear it from someone else, you know, whether one of their little friends tells them because their parent had said something or, you know, and, and, you know, me personally, I didn't want them to hear it from anyone but me, you know, because this is my thing that I own and I should, you know, explain to them. So, um, it was not too long ago, a few months ago, we were all getting our, our vaccine, um, you know, just our, update a booster a booster and our kids were getting it and our they were kind of complaining like oh my arm hurts from this shot and i was i was putting boston to bed and i said oh yeah shots are not not great but dad gets a shot every week you know <laughs> not thinking you know i was trying to make it sound like well man up i get one every week you know <laughs> and and now him being more, Observing. you know, just a smarter kid, he kind of goes, well, why do you get a shot every week, dad? And I was like, oh, Hold on, no. let me go get mom. <laughs> and I, and I story. yeah, I <laughs> paused for a minute and processed through my head, okay, is this, is this now when I tell him? And I sat there and went, okay. And I said, well, wait here just a minute. And so I went into our daughter's bedroom where Kay was putting her to sleep. And I said, can you guys come in here for a minute? And they're like thinking maybe a bedtime story. Yeah. What's happening? <laughs> and brought him in. And, you know, I remember Kay was at the end of the bed and I was sitting up towards the top. And I said, um, Boston asked me why I get a shot every week. And I remember the look between us and she kind of looked like this is happening like right now, now. right and, before bedtime. Yeah. And I said, <laughs> yeah, we, we need to do this. And so we kind of started, you know, really simple terms, you know, do you know what transgender means or is And he And he had kind of a, you know, a rough definition that was pretty close. Like, Oh, isn't it a, a boy, that wants to be a, a girl or, you know, or, you know, you know, in a very elementary kind of was it term. Was like a tomboy or like, did he say? Well, I think he said, uh, you know, one gender wanting to become another gender. And I said, that's oh yeah, it. that's roughly, you know, it's, and then I kind of gave him a, a more explanation and, and, and I told him, well, dad is transgender. And, you know, he, he's really a smart kid and he sat and kind of processed it and had, a, you know, a few questions, you know, like, oh, you mean you were a girl, one, you know, kind of thing. And, and yeah, and I have to tell you, that was probably the hardest, um, me telling someone about me because, you know, you, again, you value so much what your kids think about you. And I didn't want him to think less of me as a parent. And, and I had worked so hard to be dad and I didn't want that to go away. And so, um, uh, I, we kind of said, so what do you think? I mean, that's a lot of information to give a, an eight-year-old little boy. And um, and he had the sweetest answer. He said, you know what? You're still my dad. And... 
and I guess that's all I needed. Dare him say that it didn't matter. He didn't see me any different. I was still his dad. So I'm still dad. <laughs> so, it, and that was probably the hardest one that I've had to. But he also, it was really cool. His understanding level seemed really mature because he said a comment that I'll never forget. Like, it makes me sad to know that you didn't get to stand out and you didn't get to fit in. He's eight. He blew my mind. I was yeah. like, what did you just say? <laughs> like, yeah, you got that? Just the compassion he had at that age where they think about video games and basketball, but just to, I mean, to see that it was really emotional for me to uh, express that to him and, and let him in. These, these kids get it. They really will be the, the force to be reckoned with, with this topic. Yeah. I think it will stop with them. Yeah, they... I they, mean, the growth will continue with them in a way. Yeah. They are the future. And, and I think the world is seeing a far more inclusive generation. It's better than when we went to school. And I think we're being better educated as parents as well to help this community. It's a lot. It's a lot. Good bookend to your story. It's been a marathon as well. Just um, all three of your episodes, uh, just nuggets of wonder in all of these stories. And I, and I think the takeaway for me, I mean, there's, I just keep thinking about all different aspects of the story, but um, the great takeaway is just the beauty of authenticity and the beauty of, of naturally allowing things to unfold as they should. I think that's the message of so many stories. We shouldn't find ourselves restricted or f feel like we're boxed in, that our experiences are uh, rigid and unmalleable. That would defy and defeat the whole purpose of our existence, that we are as we talked about earlier, a phoenix, a bird. It's, we are we are designed with wings to fly. And yeah. with without and I've said this in this podcast and in episodes like this before, in this very studio, um, one of the guests said, Cages or wings? Which do you prefer? Which do the birds prefer? To fly. Yeah. We have to fly. And and I think your story's been beautiful. It's uh it's all about visibility and it's all about love and honor and and all of the things that are necessary to build a good community, but more importantly, a good family and a good relationship. So thank you. Thank you for being vulnerable and, and sharing your story when you didn't have to and when you don't owe the world your story, but you um, are removing boulders from the path for uh, young queer kids who are just navigating this journey and families and church leaders and those who listen to episodes like this to make that trail a little less rocky um, and a little easier to navigate. Uh, thank you. Just on behalf of the audience, thank you. Oh, yeah, you thank bet. Thank you for having us, and thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. Same thing, paving the way, making it easier. I'm all about visibility. Opening the yeah. cages, you got the keys. <laughs> yeah. Well, these kids need to see what's possible, you know. They already know the roadblocks. They already know the heartache. They need to see Love. the possibilities of what life can bring them and that there's a lot out there for them. Love conquers all. It's a great way to end. Thank you, you two. Thank you. I appreciate it again. Kay and Chris, Packer, excellent episodes. If you missed um, the I don't know where you're jumping in. But you've got to make sure you hit Kay's episode, Chris's episode. And obviously, thank you for joining us on the couples episode. Um, it has been a good opportunity to better understand the experiences of uh, these two wonderful people. And I've 
I've felt like I got great things out of it. If you also, um, what, what did you learn? What did you uh, resonate with? What, what is something new that you hadn't considered before? I would definitely be interested in hearing that. Uh, if you are watching on our video version, be sure to um, include it. Uh, let us know in the live chat. Uh, also, sharing episodes like this does wonders for visibility, uh, the very things we talked about in this podcast episode. So we invite you, if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube, to share this episode. Even just tagging a friend or someone who um, might benefit from this episode allows us a much bigger and stronger reach. Uh, also, if you are listening on, on the audio version of this podcast, um, through Latter Gay Stories, through one of our podcast players, through Apple, uh, Stitcher, iTunes, uh, uh, Google, iHeartMedia, or one of the other podcast players, we invite you to subscribe to the channel and also leave us a rating. Those two methods help us to build bigger and stronger bridges between uh, the LD, LGBTQ community and the LDS community as well. Again, we want to thank you for giving us a Sometimes they say an hour of your time. We gave a little bit more than an hour of your time for the Packers episode, but it's uh, time well, well spent, in my opinion. So thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode and the many others that we have here on the podcast. It is stories like Kay and Chris and your own that help us each to continue writing our own latter gay story. <laughs>